it away from there. Uh, one, two, and three. Sorry. Thank you very much. My name is Desmond Williams. I'm a senior health specialist with um, the Human Development Group and DFID. Um, I have just a few brief and simple questions, which I'm sure will be, won't take much time. Uh, I'm just thinking about the work, uh, the most simplest one really is, but I'm aware that there's going to be preparatory work and country case studies running up to the HLF4 next year. Is that going to be linked in at all with the you know, your call, your, your suggestion for key conclusions that we need you know, further country case studies for this sort of work. Um, the other one which, is a, which may be ringing alarm bells in some of our minds is there was a paper recently in The Lancet from Chris Murray's team and the, uh, you know, looking at the problem of, of substitution and additionality with budget support, particularly in health spend um, in many countries, which I think has added to the problem that Jasmine has, sort of, uh, has, has mentioned regarding uh, sort of concerns around budget support as a modality. Um, and I was wondering, fi finally, really, is um, what do you see, I mean, this issue about the missing middle that has been touched on earlier, I mean, and I wonder, um, is this a particular issue that is, how, how the EC takes this issue forward? Because I know that in many countries, compared to many bilateral partners, the EC doesn't have that much often of a technical country ex sort of uh, capacity for engaging with partners um, on, on issues of the, the technicality of, of aid delivery and, and monitoring and, and design. And I wondered if that was a, uh, something that you'd looked at in, in your studies. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, Phil Sigley, Federation of Cocoa Commerce, uh, obviously private sector in the cocoa business. Um, one of the areas I find quite astounding is that we don't realize where this middle, missing middle is because if you actually take time, and I'll take Ghana as an example, where you've got the district assembly system. The district assemblies themselves, I've got, my, got down there and got dirty with some of the information, and I was able to you know, take on board rafts of information about water, children in schools, school blocks, there's so much data residing actually in the local authorities themselves, but no money was coming through from the centre. So the budget support in Ghana's case, for my money, seems to be promoting some sort of urban drift where uh, the ideology of our international development department seems to be suggesting some sort of diversification. But the engine room of these countries, which is the rural community, the agriculture, is being significantly neglected in terms of where this aid gets to. Now, I've tried with DFID, I've tried with Jean-Michel Severino at AFD and, and others to try and say, look, the private sector can see that somewhere between Jeffrey Sachs on the one hand and Ambisa Moyo on the other, there is a way forward which involves the private sector and how these local, these local communities perceive of capital accumulation or do not. Because basically there is no culture of service provision uh, using, the, using the community as a focus point. It's whatever's handed down or trickles down or doesn't from the center. And of course GBS uh, is something that we need to look at very, very carefully and its dissemination has been said by the speakers and the, and the commentators. But it's a critical area of how you engage local communities to see that there is actually a future in the, in the, by improvement in services. I and mean, I could tell you from the cocoa business, the farmers try and keep their money away from this and they don't reinvest at all as if they can help it in their own communities. And that is a big issue as to why budget support and other forms of support may be not as effective as they could be. Thank you. Uh, yes, hello. My name is uh, Sebastian Gehardt, and I'm a researcher on aid effectiveness at the University of Warwick. Um, yeah, I also would like to thank you for the presentation. You know, very fascinating paper. Um, the one question I have for Jonathan, and which I think mirrors something of what Professor Morrissey has said, um, starting your presentation, you you made the note that budget support is still a very small part of of what donors give on aid, and you know plays a rather uh, minimal role and then you go on to compare countries that receive high amounts of budget support and low amount of budget supports and I was wondering you know since we're talking there about countries like Uganda or Ghana which has been mentioned to what degree uh, you have looked into 
whether those countries that receive a lot of budget support also receive greater amounts of aid in general, project aid and things like that. And if you sort of have control for these factors and, and what you know evidence you have that teases out of this data that it's truly the budget support part of the aid and not just, you know, perhaps equally well, just greater amounts of project aid or general aid that is um, responsible or could be responsible for these associations that you have found. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We'll take just those three questions, then we'll do another round uh, and keep going from there. Um, Jonathan, do you want to comment? And Stephen, I don't know if you want to come in just on the, the health and the decentralization aspects as well, maybe. Jonathan. Thanks, Marcus. Um, thank you for the question. Let me take the last one first, because I think that's probably the, the easiest to deal with. The, the data that I presented, although there's, there's more in the, in the paper, um, was looking specifically at budget support as a share of ODA receipts. So in other words, you know, the, the countries like the Ghanas and Ugandas of the world, um, where a comparatively high proportion of their overall aid receipts is in the form of budget support, you, know, you, you, you are you're, you're already taking into account the, the non-budget support bit, okay? Because it's what's, it's what's left over. We basically did the analysis on, on, on two levels. We looked at um, we looked at uh, the, the GBS to ODA ratio for each individual recipient country, but we also looked at the GBS to GDP ratio. And while there were some slight differences in results depending on our choice of GBS ratio, the, the, the basic pattern was, was essentially the same. Um, Phil, your, your question, I mean, I, the, I think one could have um, a, a very long discussion which maybe this is not the place and I'm probably not the, the, the best equipped person to try and respond to the relative merits of private sector provision and, or, or government provision of particular services or leaving space for the private sector to engage. One thing I would say, which I think was partly what you were getting at, about the, the lack of resources that, are, that materialize in the engine room, you know, at local level, district level, where it's all supposed to happen. I think it would be a fair comment to say that as, um, as we have, as many donor agencies have provided more and more budget support, some of the elements of analysis that ought to go with that provision including, for example, the um, public expenditure tracking surveys, those kinds of things which try and assess not specifically where budget support flows go, because by definition they go into the Treasury and then mingled with the other resources the government has, but certainly trying to better assess uh, where the aggregate resources that the government has at its disposal go. Are there budgeted allocations to different levels of government, to different sectors being delivered in the way that they're supposed to be? That, I think, um, is something that more could be done on. Um, there is a lot of work done looking at uh, analyzing budget execution rates as part of ongoing processes of, of monitoring and dialogue between donors and government. A lot of that is looking at a fairly high level of, of aggregation. Um, and I think there probably is more scope for looking in more detail at what actually is happening at district level. I, I hesitate to, to cite the example because it's been overquoted, but it's a good one in response to your question. The work that was done in Uganda some years ago when information being posted led to significant increases in, in the actual flow of funds to, uh, to recipient local authorities uh, demonstrated how when, when you turn attention to these things, then performance can improve. And I think that's one model that many of you will be familiar with already that, that needs to be enhanced. I think, I mean, you, you can differentiate also between the, the type of services that we're talking about here as reflected in, in, in the MDGs, certainly the ones that we focused on our analysis of health and education. Of course, yes, there are private providers of those services too, but the, the focus of the study was on, the, on, on these MDG indicators of interest. I would have loved to have done, indeed had originally hoped, to look at the poverty uh, MDG and all the, all the factors that go into determining growth rates and poverty reduction rates where the private sector would have a, a, a significant role to play. But the data is just too sporadic to enable this, applying this approach to that particular um, MDG, MDG1. So it, I, I wasn't able to, to, to do that. Um, Desmond, in terms of preparatory work for HLF4, I mean, this, this piece of work has, been, has gone through a, a, 
a few, to be honest, not, not terribly many discussions within, within the Commission. Um, it's attracted quite a lot of interest. Uh, we made the point about trying to supplement this analysis with some, with some additional work, including some country case study work, uh, partly in recognition of the point that, that, that Paul or was it Stephen made, that th this, this, the conclusions only take us so far. We need to enrich that with a better understanding of what goes on at country, uh, at country level. Cam I completely agree with Paul's point. It would be so interesting to better understand why is it that some high budget support recipients perform so much better than, than, than others. At, at this point in time, as of right now, this is just, this is just a line and a slide. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no concrete action plan to try and take this further forward. It's something that I would love to see happen and who knows what will come out of this presentation and other discussions that are taking place in, in, in Brussels. On the, 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 the Lancet paper, um, I'm, I'm aware of it. I haven't read, read all of it. I mean, the basic, the, the basic issue that it raises, and I want to, to respond in, in replying to this to, to Oliver's point too, it's, a, it, it's the question of fungibility. Uh, questions as to whether budget support is more or less fungible than, than product support, I think, is a question that is still uh, is still unanswered. I know there's been uh, a lot of exchanges around that Lancet article, which have questioned both the, um, the 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 merit of the analysis, but also whether in practice it it, it matters. Should we be so concerned? Um, which I think is a really interesting debate to have. But I want to link that to to Oliver's point, because. Well, Oliver, I think your, 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 your point about um, you know, comparing this type of work with trying to assess a football manager, uh, I, I see where you're coming from, and it's certainly an, an interesting analogy. And you're, you're saying well, what really matters is both the level and the composition of, of spending. But it's linked to this fungibility question, um, because it, it's actually, we have found from experience, unless you choose to be highly conditional in your approach, which takes us into some conflict with a lot of our arguments in favour of, of ownership, then our ability, to, our ability to limit fungibility is constrained. And the desirability of attempting to limit fungibility is, I think, also questionable in some of the debates prompted by that Lancet article. Um, so for, for, for that reason, I, uh, to me, I still think that there is uh, it's important that we do try and examine the linkage between budget support and these MDG indicators of interest. At the end of the day, that is what, that is what we are all interested in trying to achieve. I take completely the point that some are more responsive and more fast reacting um, than others. And in a way, we did this particular study simply because um, we're conscious that budget support is under a higher degree of scrutiny than it has been in before. People are asking, well, what, what, what are you delivering? What are, we, what are we seeing? And we can all cite individual countries where uh, we provide large amounts of budget support and they appear to be performing quite well. And we can say, well, that's very encouraging. But there hadn't been anything systematic and comprehensive. That was the gap that we were trying to fill. Um, and I hope, hopefully with, with some success. But uh, of course, there's a lot more that, that could be done uh, along, along your lines. I think that's probably fine enough. Stephen, do you want to come in briefly on the the health and decentralisation or? Um, yeah, I might um, put them under slightly different head mm -hmm. headings than, than, than that. But, um, you, uh, Jonathan said most of what I would have said about the, 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 the fungibility issue which came up in connection with, with health. But I would, what I would add to that is that we, we can't escape the fact that, that in terms of, of information, um, the givers of aid and the supporters who give aid want to know where their, where their money's going and they want some assurance that if we say we're helping to expand education and support the MDGs, that that's happening. Now, the, the, the danger is that there are um, worse and better ways of trying to associate budget support with particular parts of, of budget expenditure. And, and, and Oliver's point about things being mediated through the budget is really important. Um, and, and I think you do need to look at the differences between um, sort of tightly earmarking and pretending uh, that because you've earmarked, you've avoided f fungibility, which is a fallacy, but one that's e easy to sell. And, and more, more general approaches would say, well, as part of our, our budget support and aid dialogue, we want to set joint targets about expenditure and be able to demonstrate that things have been going up. And you can find examples of both approaches and you can compare them. On the, on the missing uh, middle argument, I just wanted to, to, to point out one aspect of it, which comes out not only from the 
budget support evaluations, but also from the evaluation I've been involved in on the Education Fast Track Initiative, which is that you find that, in principle, there ought to be a really nice complementarity between uh, budget support that enables large-scale um, uh, expansion of basic services and more focused technical uh, support. And, but you find that very often that isn't being taken advantage of. One aspect of that is that um, moves towards budget support and other factors lead to a kind of de-skilling of the donors in, at country level with fewer sector specialists working there. On the other hand, when you do have sector specialists working there, they tend to work in very narrow silos and they don't actually necessarily know very much about the country that they're working in, in terms of how the budget and the decentralization system work. So I don't know what the answer is to that, but it's a, but it's a, real, it's a real challenge when we talk about the missing middle because we haven't got the people to fix it. If we take the football analogy, it's as if we've got budget support as a kind of fitness coach that gets everybody running around really far. But we haven't got the skills coaches that actually teach them how to score. So, <laughs> thank you. Okay, I can see with World Cup coming, we're going to be going down this <laughs> <laughs> uh, quite a lot. Um, okay, I've got too many questions to deal with, so I'm going to be rather ruthless. And ODI people, I'm sorry, I'm not going to take your questions. So, um, but I've got one here, one over there, and then Nick. Okay, for sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank so, you. Yeah, one thank you. over there. Great. Uh, my name is Laura Sochas. I'm a student at uh, the London School of Economics doing a master's in public administration. Um, and I've actually also worked uh, for the delegation of the EC in Lesotho last year, uh, where budget support uh, had some serious difficulties. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, why did you think that budget support was effective? Was it because um, there's a high degree of selectivity and actually conditionality uh, sort of hidden in it? Or whether it's um, really because of greater ownership and um, the lesser burden, the lesser administrative burden that it poses on countries. Um, and if you think it's the latter, which is what the whole thinking around budget support uh, tends to stress, um, why do you look at the performance in MDGs as your outcome, given that really budget support should help countries um, fulfill their own priorities and not necessarily all of these MDGs at once? Thank you. Hi, I'm Sophie Stevens. I'm here on behalf of James Putzel at the Crisis States Research Centre, who's been involved in the OECD um, paper recently published. And I've been working um, as an intern, helping him look at some of the other questions he still wanted to explore, um, especially around sector-wide approaches and the relationship to budget support um, and general administrative capacity of governments. And I wanted to ask a question that touched on some of the things that have already come up, which is that in some of the sector-wide approaches literature, which some of the best that I found comes from the ODI, as you all know, <laughs> um, discusses not so much um, the role of the modality and the relationship of the modality simply as it is with outcomes, but the way that it connects to budget cycles, the way that it works through existing management systems, and issues that touch more on what the gentleman was saying about uh, the bit in between and how it's distributed. And I found those to be some of the most interesting findings. But in terms of the general budget support, we've had a lot of difficulty in tracking down any real rigorous studies on how the budget support connects to political situations political developments and it seems to be um, such a mystery you can only find hints of where um, the budget support is working through parliaments or not is it um, how is the financial ministry working directly with the presidency or these different questions which seem to throw up some very interesting issues in terms of how we can look at the success or not of general budget support so my question is um, how could you propose to explore these political context because it seems from some of the things we've seen that they're extremely important in determining the success. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you. Mick, Mick Foster. Um, very interesting and useful paper. Just, just two comments. Um, for those of us who have been working on budget support for a long time, the original rationale that was very important in why we went towards it was that in highly aid-dependent countries, it's very difficult to manage project aid. So one interesting thing to explore would be, is there a difference between 
the impact it has in a highly in, in a country which, where a large share of total public spending, a large share of GDP, is coming as aid. In that situation, I would have thought that getting more of it onto general budget support so that it works with government systems and it is more important than in a country which has got relatively low aid dependence where it's perfectly possible to manage project aid if projects are only a relatively small proportion of your total public expenditure the transactions costs are, are perfectly manageable and you can confine them to the investment program and it, it's not a big problem so that would be one area that would be interesting to i'd be interested to explore the differences and just a comment on the health on the health indicator that you use um, Child mortality, I guess, is, is measured essentially through demographic health surveys and censuses. So you've, you've probably not got annual data. What, what you may have is a lot of interpolated figures in between surveys done every three or five years. And, and so maybe one way to, to, to look at those figures again would be to look at some of the some of the more output rather than outcome indicators, output indicators like immunization coverage and there are various other ones that come out of the what works in health literature which, which might give, where you might find a bit of a stronger association. Thanks. Thank mm. um, <clears throat> I'll do the same thing. Thanks Mick. Um, taking, going in reverse order. I think your point about looking at health output type indicators would be, would be definitely worth exploring. We, we basically wanted to use uh, information that was readily accessible in the public <coughs> domain, had been through at least some process of, of uh, standardization where such was necessary, interpolation if there was, if there was missing data. Uh, we didn't have the time or the resources, and it seemed to, be a, to us to be inappropriate to try and construct our own sort of country-specific database. But, but I think um, uh, the, the, it would be interesting, certainly, to, to explore that, um, uh, looking at the, the health indicator in particular. On the, the aid to budget ratio, I mean, I, you're, you're right, it would be, that would be, a th we already have GBS to ODA ratio, we have the GBS to GDP ratio. Um, to the extent that spending as a percentage of GDP is broadly similar, then that would be a proxy for the GDP to budget ratio. But it's, I, I didn't actually do the I didn't assess it. I suspect there's actually a fair degree of, of differentiation in the spending to GDP ratio. So this would, this could indeed be a, a third indicator, sorry, a third measure of our GBS ratio to look at. Um, um, yeah, part two. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sophie, your your question about the political situation. I mean, again, that's. Mm, that is a huge agenda, absolutely massive. Uh, lots of questions have been asked of us in the Commission, and I'm sure other donor agencies providing budget support as well, about the extent to which budget support supports or maybe undermines domestic accountability. Uh, what account does it take of these domestic political processes, the parliamentary accounts committees, um, civil society organisations trying to hold governments to account, etc. I think one of the all I could say in response um, is that I think it's, a, it's an area that certainly the Commission and I know others are, are very conscious of. There's been a lot of work produced recently uh, by the Commission, I know DFID has done some too, um, looking at these broader political economy questions and what, uh, what the, the interaction between those and budget support is. At this point in time, um, it's not directly affecting the decisions taken about the uh, the choice of countries or the design of budget support arrangements, but I'm sure it's going to happen. It's, it's definitely rising up the up the agenda. And uh, the question over here about um, why is why do we think budget support is is effective? And um, well, Mick has already pointed out one of the arguments presented, and that is that in heavily aid dependent countries where we we have witnessed, we have, we, we, we've already seen firsthand uh, the, the negative effects that large numbers of donors competing with each other to provide similar projects but using different processes, systems, reporting requirements, poaching the best staff, etc., have had. I mean, that, that, that is well known. Uh, in spite of that, the aid literature on the effectiveness of aid and the projects is, 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 is reasonably positive. And budget support was in part a response to that, a recognition that aid just needed to be more effective. 
and supporting um, domestic policy, supporting ownership were two elements of that, of that uh, process. Your question then is, well, why didn't we choose the government's own targets and forget about the MDGs? Um, can be can be answered at one level in that pretty much every government has signed up to the MDGs, at least in principle. That's not for one moment to say that within their own development strategies they have a set of targets which are identical to those that the MDGs themselves would imply. But their strategies are in many cases uh, influenced and informed by the MDGs. And it's a similar, in, in, in part my reply is similar to what I gave to, to, to Mick, and that was that we simply had to use a, a set of internationally comparable data that would allow us to make these kind of assessments. It's also the case um, that in in responding to, to uh, I was going to say critics, or concerns about well, where our aid is going and how effective it is being, the NDGs, flawed though some of them might be, have gained enormous traction. It is what people are focused on. It is what people are interested in. And it is becoming the, the benchmark against which we need to be trying to assess our performance. That's not to say that at country level, when we engage with, whether it's Lesotho or, or wherever, that the dialogue that takes place between the donor community, and not just the donor community, and the government is, and certainly should be, around their own priorities and policies and targets, which would be, their, their, which would be shaped or influenced by the MDGs, but are not necessarily the MDGs. OK. Thank you. We've got time just for one more round of questions. So, um, this is back uh, there and there. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tony Ridley. I am a civil engineer, emeritus professor at Imperial College, and inter alia, I was part of Task Force 10 of the MDG program with Calestis Juma. I've got a detailed question for Jonathan, and that is the question of, of the lag of um, the lag of uh, outcomes from the timing of budget support. I may have missed it. Did you take it into account and were you able to measure or calculate how great or small the lag was following budget support? Hi, um, I'm Bruno Versailles. I'm a researcher at Oxford University, and um, I'm also involved in uh, some of the new work that's being done uh, on evaluating budget support. Uh, most notably, I'm working, there's three pilot countries that are um, on course, Mali, Tunisia, and Zambia, where a new methodology approved by the DAC is being rolled out. Um, and kind of, so I'm speaking kind of with that experience in mind, we're, we're still working on that. And I'm kind of a bit surprised and I, I have quite strong feelings about this after working on, on the Mali um, case, is that it seems that we're, this is essentially an evaluation or you're trying to do s answer some evaluation questions. And with, in most evaluation literature, I think um, you should start when you kind of um, uh, start a, an, an aid program, it should have written into it like a good evaluation um, bit. So I'm kind of a bit surprised that, and this is kind of linked to the to the missing middle also, like in the new methodology that we're developing um, with the DAC, it's basically what we're trying to do here with, with trying to um, link budget support to uh, MDGs. Um, it's to, you, you're going in through, through, through two steps and um, linked to, to what Oliver was also saying. First, you're looking at budget support and kind of, the dialogue from inputs to outputs, what are you doing, the, the treasury account. And then secondly, what I think you should do is look at government policies and how the government treasury system is working, and then look at the link with, um, with outputs and outcomes. The thing is, kind of once you start, and I hope perhaps budget support in, a, in the next generation perhaps can do this more often, is looking at this middle, uh, missing middle, and look at perhaps a couple of sectors um, education or health or whatever, and actually try and use um, more of the of the recent um, evaluation methodologies that have been uh, developed. For example, the treatments effect literature, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and have a discussion between donors and recipients across the table in a general budget support kind of dialogue, and see kind of through 
rigorous evaluation methodologies at the micro level, see what works, what doesn't work, and then budget support can actually come in and support the, the, the policies that you've been evaluating and that, that are working. So kind of much more of a, a, um, a proactive attitude and looking forward rather than always kind of looking backward whilst as um, uh, Mr. Lister said, like, you know, you're changing the goalpost often when, when you, and it's really, really hard to evaluate these kind of things. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Melissa Hall from ActionAid. For the speaker who wondered about political space, we did a bit of work a few years ago, ActionAid and CARE, on budget support and civil society, so that might be worth looking at, looking at the relationship between budget support and political space. Um, the question which comes from some of the work that I do, which is more public facing often, the you know public perception of aid is still very much, as Stephen might um, might worry, around technical assistance. So people here in the UK think that doctors, nurses and teachers are bought with our aid money, not giving cheques directly to governments. And what they're worried about is corruption. So my question would be, um, if you could look at something like the Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index and do some kind of correlation with that as well. Thank you. Um, okay, I, would you mind if we just squeeze in two more questions and then we'll wrap the roughly all up there? Uh, was there any, any more time for two more questions? One last one. Okay, Paul. Sorry, Sam, you're disqualified being ODI, I'm afraid. You have to talk afterwards. Okay, Paul. Hi, Paul Mallard, DFID. Um, Jonathan, I just wanted maybe to add to your list of research options for the mm. future, but maybe not just you, maybe mm. everybody else. Mm. Uh, one one is, is something which I don't think we touched on very much, is, is the issue of hybridisation in the sense that, that, I mean, in many countries we might have sort of like four ounces of budget support and two ounces of technical assistance, and <clears throat> we've got policy advice mixed in there as well. And, and, you know, there's another new ingredient on the block which is called multi-buy expenditure or, or um, bilateral aid which is provided through multilateral. We have the vertical funds as well. So, so in terms of instrumentation, I mean, it's, it's a much messier affair than it once used to be. And, you know, allegedly all of these instruments have been mixed together to support the country-led approach. So, so is, is it not the mix we should be looking at and what the, maybe the ideal mix is for particular circumstances? And maybe that's the thing, or maybe that might be a better way of looking at some of these issues. Thank you. Okay, John, I'll turn to you, and if any of the panel want to come in briefly at this point as well, then we can, then we can close. Jonathan. Okay, thank you for those um, for those questions, um, Melissa. Let me ask answer yours. First. I wasn't quite sure what you were wanting me, uh, what you were suggesting should be done. Whether we analyse whether countries receiving large amounts of budget support have a, a better or worse CPI corruption yeah. perceptions index. Yeah. Well, ideally one would. Um, I haven't done the analysis. Uh, I'd invite anybody to try. Um, for the simple reason that the, and for the simple reason that we were, the question we were directing our analysis at was the linkage between budget support and MDGs. For the reason that I said at the beginning, that that, that is where there appears to be a gap, and that is where ultimately we are aiming our aid to have an impact on. Um, and it made, so to, 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 to Bruno and to, and to Paul, I, I guess my response is, is similar. Bruno, th I said it, this is not an evaluation, uh, and it wasn't intended to be an evaluation. It was prompted in part by what I saw within the Commission, and I know other donors do the same as well, a tendency to try and support the case for budget support by picking a few individual countries, whether it's Uganda or Burkina Faso or wherever, and saying, here's a country to which we provide a lot of budget support, and by the way, haven't they done well? So our budget support must be, uh, must be a good thing, mustn't it? Now, the point I was making was that those illustrations can be, can be very helpful, um, partly for annual reports and public relations, but more than that, I think you know, they, they, they do tell useful stories. What we were trying to do with this was to say, um, you can prove anything with an individual case study. You could prove other examples by picking a particular country which may have received a lot of budget support where progress was not so great. All we wanted to do was to stand back and be systematic, look at every single aid recipient, and then we had our samples looking at the ACP region and the Africa region, and just ask the question, 
when we look at them comprehensively, is there any relationship between levels of budget support and NDG performance? That was, that was all we were trying to do. I think the points that, that, that you make, and was it Stephen was made, made earlier about no, Paul, then, then we really need to understand what is actually going on in country. Um, what, do we, what is this missing middle, and how can we make it appear, if you see what I mean? How can we really understand why in some countries budget support seems to work better than others? And what can we use that understanding to improve it in those countries where performance appears to be less good? Those are, those are two very separate exercises, and I think the, the evaluations will be enormously important and helpful for us. I would just point out that the, the, the pilots are going on now um, in, in Mali, Tunisia, and, and Zambia. Uh, I think preliminary results are, are, are coming forth now, but they're expecting to report for formally at the end of this year. There will then be a process of reviewing the methodology in the light of those three pilots, refining the methodology as necessary, then commissioning more studies, each of which is taking more than a year to do. I and mean, we're looking at 2012, 2013 before we have a, a, a more comprehensive set of information on which we can draw some policy conclusions. And uh, the, invaluable that will be, but the, it, it's addressing a different, a different question. And in, in a way, Paul, I think your point about um, don't we need to look at budget support in the context of the other things that go with it uh, and looking at you know, hybridization, vertical funds? You're absolutely right, but I see that as being part of the kind of more, more detailed country case study work that is, that is necessary, um, whether as part of a formal evaluation or, or whether as part of something more comprehensive. This, this work, I mean, Andrew put a huge amount of time on, the, on just the number crunching, um, I put in a fair bit of time on, on the writing, but it was done in the margins of work that we we're doing at, at, the, commi at, at the commission anyway. Um, and I think they're, they're the different types of work that you're, that you're thinking of. Uh, Tony Ridley, sorry, your, your question, just, just very, very, very simply. No, in this analysis, we weren't looking at lags at all. We were looking at average improvements in our NDGs of interest between 2002 and 2007, the years fluctuated slightly depending on data availability, and average levels of budget support over that 2002 to 2007 period. The, the point that I think I made at some point was that it would be interesting to perhaps explore some of these, uh, to, to explore whether there are lagged effects as one means of perhaps trying to address better than we've been able to so far, this question of, of causality. But again, that's... That's, that's all part of, of, of part two, whether for, whether for us or for, for others, I don't know, but it's certainly something that needs to be explored. Um, yeah, I think that was it. Thank you. If any of the panel have got a 30-second 200 intervention, come in now. <laughs> oh, no. Quick one on fungibility. Um, <coughs> you know, a colleague, Mark McGillivray, and I have been spending almost 10 years trying to demonstrate that fungibility is a distraction. And obviously, we've got a lot, lot, another 10 years to keep going at it. The basic problem is that fungibility is a concern about static expenditure allocation. When you look at the fiscal dynamics, it tends to disappear. So it is a distraction. And it's relevant to that Lancet paper. I think, that, I think it is a careful analysis, but it is, a base, it is an, an inherently static analysis. And I have a concern that once you look at it in the broader context, it might disappear. And they also make a, a crucial assumption. They have to deal with a, a data problem. And they make a crucial assumption in how they estimate government's own spending on health. And the way in which they do that predisposes them to find the result they find. And I think if you do it a different way, their result might disappear. Just I haven't got time to do this. <laughs> Did you want to go? Yeah, just a couple of closing remarks. Um, and I think it's clear that budget support obviously doesn't hold all of the answers. I mean, um, our research as well shows that spending on health and education does increase with budget support, and despite the fact it's been brought up uh, today. You know, service delivery doesn't always translate to the local level, although there is a lot of budget support that goes towards supporting the capacity of local government as well, incre increasingly. But the evidence does show that people's access to services also has improved. Um, so, you know, I think it's worth making sure that we look at all the factors when we, when we think about the successes of budget support. Also to say it's not just about the service delivery, 
Budget support can also help to hold governments to account you know, as a form of effective aid. It can improve systems. You know, we know from the research that it helps to develop capacity, public financial management systems, and can even expose corruption. Um, some research we carried out recently in Zambia, where there's been a corruption case, showed that it was partly through budget support and the kind of um, the kind of accountability conditions that were put in place that helped to reveal uh, to you know to show that the corruption was happening. So it can also help to do that. Um, also, I think one other final point: if there was greater predictability, less volatility, then we might see a much stronger impact of budget support on the services delivered and the ability of it to perform. And 15 to 20 percent of Overall, I think overall aid is lost in terms of volatility. So that's a huge amount. Um, there needs to be much, much more work on this, but I think there also needs to be more kind of honest debate about the fact that not, not all aid works, but when it does, it, you know, it can work very well. And on that note, I'd say we've just launched a report as well. It's a short plug, um, 21st Century Aid, and we're having a discussion um, next Thursday with Andrew Mitchell, the new Secretary of State, on that very issue. So if you'd like to come along and have a look at the Ox Oxfam website. Uh, thank you very much. Jonathan, closing? Mm. Uh, I've given you no seconds. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll be very brief. I think most, as all, most of what needs to be said has already been said. But um, uh, thank you for the chance to present this. I'm being encouraged by, by the, the reactions and some of the comments made. This is absolutely not the, the last word. It's, only, it's not, even the, not even the first word. It was trying to fill a specific purpose. It was just trying to, to fill a gap and, and encourage a debate. Um, I think some of the additional research questions that have been raised and the much more substantial case study work that will be necessary are going to be enormously important and helpful to all of us working on budget support to improve the way in which budget support is provided. I will say that we, we entered into this particular study with, with uh, not quite sure what we would find at all. Obviously we were hopeful, but we, we, were, we were not confident about how, um, how clear the findings would be. So in that sense, we were actually pleasantly surprised and, and quite in, uh, and encouraged by them, particularly when uh, we went through the process of trying to control for some factors at any rate um, that might have explained and probably do explain um, the, the, the positive association that, that we are there. Given, as, as, as I said at the beginning and as Jasmine just alluded to, the, the budget support overall is still, it's still really quite small um, uh, in terms of the overall level of aid provided given that it is quite small, that we get these, effect, these results at all was, was really, I thought, um, quite, quite encouraging. And I do hope that this will uh, be, be useful as to all of us as we go forward in thinking about the, the effects of budget support um, and will uh, inform some of the more detailed analysis that needs to follow up afterwards. So thank you very much. Right, just made close to say to thank you, Jonathan, thank you, our panellists, uh, for coming. Uh, thank you for coming and joining in and making it such a rich discussion. Uh, it clearly is an incredibly live debate. It's a debate that we need better data on. We can certainly do with many more PhDs, so there's <laughs> out of that coming out of it. But also it's massively important as we go into the current fiscal environment, knowing whether or not this instrument does actually produce results, and if so, does it produce results that represent good value for money, is going to be a really critical test. Uh, and thank you very much for being prepared to share with us uh, and to debate with us uh, on this really important topic. Thank you very much for coming. If you want to see Jonathan's presentation, if you want to see his paper, it's all on the ODI website. Uh, if you want to get in touch with Jonathan, write to ODI. We'll forward anything if his email address isn't actually already given on that. But thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, panellists.